I like that. I like the way that worked out. Uh, I, I've, I've heard the story of uh, a guy who got up and he sang a solo. And a man in the back stood up and said, Praise God, brother, sing it again. And so he did. He finished that song. And the guy in the back stood up and said, Sing it again. And so the soloist, he kind of gulped a little bit. And he sang it again. Third time, the man in the back stood up and said, Sing it again. And keep on singing it till you get it right. <laughs> so, we didn't get a mulligan today, uh, Brother Chris, with the choir, but that's all right. <laughs> it worked out just fine. We probably sounded better not being covered up with the music than otherwise. Uh, I've got me a little note today, a little reminder. It says, Todd, exclamation point, for the glory of Jesus Christ and the benefit of the people, exclamation point times five. I thought of my old buddy today, a man who mentored me for 10 years without it being called that, who would say from time to time, among other things, a preacher, when he gets up in front of the pulpit, he needs to ask himself this, am I a vessel through whom God can speak? Am I a vessel through whom God can speak? And we've got to remember, this about Jesus. It's about what He has done. It's about the truth of His Word. It's not about anything else. And so I, I have a very uh, serious sense of respect for the Lord this morning. Something special about today. Something special about what God wants to do. And I take it very, very seriously. And if you would, go with me over to Matthew chapter 8. I want to read with you some things. And then I want to share with you some things that come out of the book of Romans. If you've never read the book of Romans, I recommend that you do it sometime. Read it slowly and read it prayerfully and read it thoughtfully. If we don't have the book of Romans, our theology is pretty sketchy when it comes to salvation. We need to know not only what we believe, but we need to know why we believe it. And the Bible is our final authority, and Romans is just a beautiful picture of what salvation really, really means. It's the nuts and bolts of what Jesus taught, and then what He demonstrated, and then what He did. And what I want to do this morning is I want to read one verse from the very beginning of Romans chapter 8, and then I want to jump down to verses 28 and following and read something to you that I typed out and give you a few points. But Romans chapter 8 says this, verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1. Did I say Matthew? Romans 8. Y'all are supposed to be in my head and understand what I'm thinking. Romans 8, 1. I meant to do that just to see if you're paying attention. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And let me read that one more time. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And then go with me to verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose, for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. And whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 32, He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is He that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? 
As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. For I am persuaded. For I am persuaded. That means there's absolutely no doubt that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to share with you this morning on the full advantage of God's purpose. The full advantage of God's purpose. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for what, we, what we've experienced so far. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for the worship. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for everybody who is here. We want to pray especially this morning for those who could not make it because of sickness or illness or other things. And we just ask right now that as we study your word that you would speak to our hearts. And that it would be all you. And I pray, Lord, that all hearts would be open and receptive to understanding what it is that you're saying to each one of us individually. Holy Spirit, walk among us. Lord Jesus, be glorified. God, have your perfect will this morning. And we praise you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The full advantage of God's purpose. Purpose singular. I typed this out and I'll read it to you without looking at you too much. But it says this. As one reads the book of Romans with an open mind, he or she will begin to recognize a pattern and purpose to the thoughts laid out by the Apostle Paul. In this beautiful treatise on salvation. From chapter 1 all the way to our present study, we find amazing truth after truth that helps us understand what salvation is, why we need it, how we obtain it, the blessings from it, and the responsibilities of it. Again, salvation. Great doctrine on, let me get fancy with some words, great doctrine on justification. Regeneration, transformation, mortification, sanctification, and glorification. They all lead to a deep understanding of God's gift to mankind. Knowing all those words won't buy you any Starbucks, that's for sure. But it'll make you sound impressive, even if you can't spell them. But chapter 8, when we get to chapter 8, it talks about preservation. Another one of those words that ends with I-O-N. Preservation. Once God saves us, He keeps us. We can be born again and we can have new lives and our lives can have purpose, relevance, and security during these dark days in which we live. All because of salvation by grace. The salvation of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And remember this about salvation. It is by grace through faith plus nothing minus nothing based on what the scriptures tell us. And the book of Romans is all that any sinner needs. And we're all born sinners. Romans also tells us that. But some may wonder when they think about this, people who are not familiar with, with scripture and church and, and, and that sort of thing, what's the point? What's the purpose? The purpose of God, the purpose of the Bible why did God send His Son to die for us and save us? And why was Jesus willing to do it? What's His motive? The first answer, which for some is difficult to understand, is quite simple. He loves us. Love. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life and God loves us too much to leave us in the condition we're in but there's a second answer to that question that's just as true and is closely related to the first reason for salvation and that answer is we're saved for the glory of God for the exaltation and glorification of Christ throughout the ages because of the great love wherewith he loved us and Hodge says that Jesus Christ is the central point in the history of the universe. His glory as the glory of God in, is the highest form of its manifestation. 
It is the great end of creation and redemption. And the Father and Son loved us so much that they did everything necessary to save us from death and hell. And they deserve all the praise and all the glory forever and ever and ever. And that is the twofold purpose of the plan of salvation. And as we arrive at Romans chapter 8, Paul, he begins a discussion on all the blessings and advantages that have been made available to the believer through the accomplishment of God's purpose. Salvation for man, glory for God. It's a great chapter on preservation and the security of the believer, but so much more. And this chapter teaches us, chapter 8, where we're at and where we're getting ready to, to look at a few points. This chapter teaches us that we have many advantages in Christ. Sometimes Christians are totally unaware of who they are in Christ and what they have in Him simply because they haven't taken the time to read about it. But ignorance is no excuse, excuse, is it? And a defeated Christian is a Christian who does not read his Bible. And he doesn't know how good he's got it. God wants you to know. And he tells us of some amazing blessings and benefits and advantages that will totally revolutionize our lives if we'll simply learn them and apply them to our lives. And Romans chapter 8 gives us the full advantage of God's purpose. The first one I see here is found in verses 1 through 3. We are no longer condemned. We are no longer condemned. If you've ever memorized the Roman road, then you know um, uh, Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus and who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. But it goes on to say, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. The condemnation has been switched. It's been switched from us to the sin. We are no longer condemned. I looked that word up in the Greek, that word for condemnation, and it's katakrima. I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but katakrima. And it means judgment against. And it gives us the idea that because we are in Christ, we're no longer in the world, we're no longer in sin. We have been made free from that judgment that's been passed against us. And it has a little bit to do with the courtroom setting. But we've been justified, verse 20 tells us. Uh, verse 1 tells us in Romans chapter 8 as well. The removal of guilt and penalty of sin and the impartation of God's righteousness. That's a whole lot to wrap your mind around. I've been, I've been studying for a lot of years now and, and I still don't quite get it. But there was a judgment upon us. There's a judgment or there's a wrath of God abiding on all sinners. But God loves us. Remember I said, He loves us. And because of that, He took corrective action in order to remove that condemnation or that judgment that's been sentenced against us. The removal of guilt has taken place for those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. The penalty of sin has been removed and the impartation of God's righteousness has been placed to our account. And that means five things if you're a note taker. The key point is we are no longer condemned, but five sub-points. We are no longer children of wrath. Ephesians 2 verse 3. We are no longer slaves to the flesh. Verse 1. We've been liberated. We are now in the Spirit. Verse 2. Our sin has been condemned instead of us. Verse 3 of Romans 8. And our sin has been paid for. Let's read verse 34, Romans 8. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Whoa, did I just read that? Amen. Jesus is making intercession for me. Deity is praying for me? Amen. I like that. I like that. But verse 34 asks the question. He starts this thought off by asking... 
Who do you think you are condemning? Christ is the one who died. Christ is the one that rose from the, de the dead. Christ is the one who did that because of the, the condemnation that was upon us. Who are you that condemn? It's Christ that is risen and He's at the right hand of God and He's making intercession for all mankind. Because He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to repentance. Come to the knowledge of truth. And so now what we find is that since the condemnation problem or the judgment problem or the consequences for our sin problem has been dealt with, the only thing that's going to send us to hell now is unbelief in Jesus Christ. Please read John chapter 3 verse 18. How about we do that right now? I'm glad you thought of that. John chapter 3. Verse 18, not Matthew, like my former misquote. I know where I'm going now. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 3. I want to read something to you. People talk about this sending you to hell and that sending you to hell. There's one thing that will send us to hell, and it's found in verse 18. Many are familiar with 16. How about 18? He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's where condemnation comes from, because Jesus has already taken care of the condemnation problem, and our sins and our lack of being able to meet God's holy standards and do things the way God would have us to do and have the right nature, it's all been taken care of. He washes us in His blood. He fills us with His Spirit. He adopts us into the family of God. And whoo, we've got a home in heaven coming someday. But there are benefits right now that we have that too many Christians are ignorant of. But we are no longer condemned. The judgment against us has been taken care of. And the impartation of God's righteousness has been applied to our account. Number two, we're no longer doomed. We're no longer doomed. Back with me to Romans chapter 8, please. Romans chapter 8, point number two, we are no longer doomed. Read with me, beginning in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for, God, for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose, a full advantage of God's purpose. Remember the title? We're called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. You ever wonder what your purpose is? be like Jesus. That's what your purpose is once you are born again. And what we find here, as well as our purpose, is that we are no longer doomed. Let's read on. Verse 31, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We're no longer condemned, but we're also no longer doomed. Have you ever heard the bell toll and it just kind of creepy to you? It affects you that way. You know, back, back in the day when they had public executions, they had them at a certain time at the town square. And that bell would boom, 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 and just say it was at 12 noon. And the guy who's fixing to get his head chopped off because of what he has done has 12 dongs before he dies. And I imagine it's pretty scary, pretty creepy for whom the bell tolls. The guy who's being executed, that's for him. He's doomed. But we're not anymore because of what Jesus Christ has done. We have advantages being in Christ. And, 
and we're no longer doomed to several things. We're not doomed to a fatalistic view of life. Everything is fate. Everything is karma. Just whatever happens. Now God is in charge of my life because we have purpose, remember? We have purpose now. And as I said, Christ likeness, verse 29. That's the whole point. And that has to do with progressive sanctification. Sanctification, just being cleansed and growing more like Christ and, and, and being set aside for sacred use. And there are some who teach it's, it's, it's kind of dying out now, but there was a time when it was very, very prevalent where those who believe that once you got saved, you got the whole package, you got sanctification instantaneously. And, and, and you got all you ever need when it came to sanctification. And we know now that, there, that the sanctification is also a process as well. We're growing to be more like Jesus Christ. And, and, and it can be done, you know, it can be done God's way. And when we finally get to where we stand before the Lord, we're like Jesus. Sanctification. I heard the story of two guys who went to Bible college and they, they roomed together. And they got in a discussion about sanctification. One believed that it was instantaneous and the other believed that it was progressive. And their discussion went from a discussion to a little bit of arguing and then it just became an all-out war. And the next thing you know, they bloodied one another's noses over sanctification. What's the point to all that? It didn't matter really whether it was instantaneous or whether it was progressive. Neither one of them had it. <laughs> Sanctification is something that God gives us and we are no longer doomed to the flesh and it controlling us because we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that we, we can know that all things work together for good. Everything that happens in your life is for a reason. Once you come into Christ, you have purpose. And you have a path set out for you. And as you pursue Him, day by day by day, He reveals things to you that you need. He gives us things that we need. He guides us. He directs us. And the things that we do have real value. You ever wonder what the point is? What's the point? What is the meaning of life? One of those old philosophical questions. We've got the answer. The answer is in a person. And His name is Jesus Christ. And we are no longer doomed to fatalism. We are no longer doomed to, hey, when I die, it's over. We are no longer doomed to just the drudgeries of life. What we do matters. Because we have a purpose. And we need to take full advantage of what God has given us in order to accomplish those purposes. Or in order to allow Him to work through us for those purposes to be accomplished. Everything that happens in your life is for a reason. But it's not fatalism. It's because God's in control. And all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Why? Because God is for us, verse 31. Because God is for us. I like that. I like being on the winning team. Amen. We are promised victory in God, verses 31 through and 37. We are promised that. And you know, God can't lie. It's against His nature. It's an impossibility. Right. Certain things God can't do. And one of them is lie. And so we understand that we are no longer doomed to this or to that. It's not preset. Our futures are wide open in Christ. And what we do has purpose and eternal meaning and significance. So never underestimate yourself or devalue yourself when it comes to that because you're special and you're unique in the eyes of God and he's got a special plan for you that only you can do and if you're removed from this world well yeah God can cover the bases if he has to Amen. but he's got a plan and a purpose for you that only you can do better stated only he can do through you number three we are no longer separated when it comes to the three advantages of God's purposes in our life. We are no longer condemned. We are no longer doomed. But then thirdly, we are no longer 
separated. And we'll read this again. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 35 asks, Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? And he goes on to, to continue discussing it for just a, just a minute. And he says, No! In all these things we're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. We've got problems sometimes, don't we? We've got challenges sometimes, don't we? We've got issues. Some of them are short term, some of them are long term. But the Apostle Paul is telling us that no matter what's going on in your world, it's not going to separate you from Jesus. It's not going to separate you from the love of God. He's talking to the children of God. But what we have to understand about this short section of Scripture is that Paul is finishing up or he's summarizing what he says in verse 1. That's why I read it this way this morning. That's why the text is as it is. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Then when we get to verses 35 through 39, it's essentially his triumphant conclusion to the statement that's found in verse 1. We cannot be separated from God. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We know that all things worked good, but then he goes on to tell us that absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of Christ because we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. God has guaranteed it. He didn't spare His own Son so that you and I could have eternal life. If God gave His Son to die for us, don't you think He has all the less important issues covered? Have you ever thought about that? He who has freely given salvation will certainly freely give us all the blessings and benefits that we need. Remember that. The greatest miracle that has ever taken place in your life is when you asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior and He took you and myself who were dead in our sins and trespasses. He cleansed us. He made us righteous. He breathed His life into us and He made a dead man live. What a miracle. What an amazing thing. The greatest of all miracles is salvation. Now, if, if God can handle that, why can't He handle other things? If we can trust Him for the biggest thing, why can't we trust Him for the smaller things? Why do we get all twisted up, knotted up, fretting and worried? Why do we make so many mistakes when, when we start facing these problems that we ought to let God handle, but yet we've got to do something about it? We've got to take the corrective action. Why is that? God's got it all covered, folks. He's got it all covered. He can handle it. And He tells us, that we are no longer separated from Him. And that is the worst thing that we could ever experience is being separated from God. You know, eternal death is not burning in hell. Eternal death is separation from the life. Amen. Hell just happens to be the place. He is our life. And when we're separated from Him, then we are dead, even though we are conscious. But God has freely given us salvation, and so He'll certainly give us all the blessings and benefits that we need. He can, and He will. Why? Because He's bigger than all our problems. He's bigger than all our problems. Why? Because He has made us victorious. Remember that Jesus came out of that grave victorious Amen. over death, hell, and the grave. He's got the keys now. He snatched them out of the devil's hands. Jesus has got all authority. He's got all the power. And He is victorious. And as part of His family, we are given what He is. We are victorious. He tells us in verse 37, Nay, and all these things, things that will come against us, things that will try to rob us, destroy us. Nay, and all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him 
that loved us. There's another Greek word for you. Nikeo. Nikeo. Alpha can, pre be, alpha can be pronounced ah, so it could be nikao. But regardless, nikeo. It means to have the victory. But there's something special in this text that doesn't happen too often. There's another word added to it. And it's huper. More than conquerors is translated more than conquerors, but in the Greek it's huper nikeo. Huper nikeo. And it means to have more than victory. Nikeo means to overcome. It means just to, to get over something. To have victory over it. It can be in a military sense, but it can also uh, have to do with elevation as well. Getting over something. Conquering something. And it's one thing to conquer. It's one thing to win. It's one thing to have the victory. But huper, or hyper, is victory on steroids. We are more than conquerors, but it's through Christ Jesus. But too often we don't realize and we don't experience the full advantage of God's purposes in our lives because we're not aware of it. Huper Nikeo, to have more than victory, reward, spoils, honor, promotion, etc. And it's because God loves us too much to leave us. It's because God loves us too much to let us go. He is victorious and because we're part of His family we are victorious as well. But remember, it's because God, it's because God loves us. He loves us so much. He loves you too much to leave you. He loves you too much to let you go. Security. Peace. Have you ever felt unloved? Paul asked that question. What's going to separate you from the love of God? Nothing. You feel alone? If you're in Christ, you're not. If you're in Christ, you are not alone and you are never alone. There's advantages of this Christianity thing, folks. It's more than just fire insurance for when you die. <laughs> We got good stuff right now. We've got good things right now. Blessings and benefits that God wants us to experience. That God wants to be a reality in our life. See, we've got to go from theory to practice. We've got to go from philosophy to experience. Yeah, I believe Jesus is the Savior. Yeah, I believe He's the Son of God. But are you saved? Yeah, I'm saved. Are you experiencing the full benefits of God's purposes for your lives? The answer, if we're honest, is no. All of us are not fully experiencing all the blessings and benefits that God has for us. But we need to remember, we need to remember that God has a purpose for us and He wants us to experience that purpose fully. I'm going to ask the musicians to come and I'm going to ask everybody, if you would, to please stand. I've got more, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to kind of finish up with this question. Do you know that the Lord loves you? Yes. Do you know that He loves you so much He died for your sins? But did you know that He loves you so much He brought all kinds of other blessings and benefits into your life and you and I just have to access them and utilize them. He's a good God. He loves you. And there's therefore now no condemnation to us. We're no longer condemned. We're no longer doomed. And we're no longer separated. Praise be to the name of Jesus. Father, we come to you. And we thank you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your benefits. And Lord, I pray that at this most important time, you would just speak to hearts, you would minister to lives. Lord, you would do what you want to do, that you would accomplish what you want to accomplish. Now, Lord, if there's anybody here who has not experienced you as their Savior, I pray that you'd save them today. Jesus Christ, Son of God, 
help us all to know that and experience that this morning. And with everybody's head bowed, everybody's eyes closed, I've talked about benefits of salvation.